means doing it in space, right. but with the technology of the spatial sensitivity, sensitivity of measuring small distances that you have on the ground. Now, let me give you what that means. LISA is able to get 10 to the minus 21 strains at very much lower frequencies than LIGO on the ground. The gr uh, there are other things on the ground that keep you from looking at uh, low frequencies below, let's say, a few hertz. There's just so much other crap going on. We haven't been able to figure out how to get around all of that. And I don't think we will. It's called Newtonian gravity gradients. Just that the density fluctuations in the atmosphere, density fluctuations in the ground, cause pull forces on the, on the mirrors, and you can't shield that. And you may be able to measure it. Anyway, I don't look how, but it, it isn't a tremendous. You might go underground a little bit, and that's what the Europeans hope to do in their vision of a third generation detector. Uh, we're not trying to do that because we think it's just too hard. Uh, but anyway, what, what is cosmic, what, 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 what is the, the idea is the following. You could, in principle with, and let me say what Lisa is, the way it gets 10 to minus 21, is it uses five times 10 to the six kilometers as the baselines, and you'll gain with the baseline. That's the strain measurement is always determined by how well you can do delta L. And if you make it delta L bigger, you can do better. That's fundamentally what it is. So it's got a very huge delta L, an L, so a very, very much larger delta L for, for the same sources. So that means that you don't have to use such a very good position sensitivity. And they can get away with a position sensitivity of 10 to the minus 12 meters. Whereas on the ground, we can't get away with a position sensitivity that's any worse than 10 to the minus 18 meters, so a factor of a million. So if you want to measure what I'm about to tell you, which is primordial gravitational waves from quantum fluctuations of the earliest moments of the universe, which is a pretty wild idea alone, crazy idea, but it's the only way people can make these waves that they know. It's made at the very, very moment when the universe was created and during, before inflation really got going or during the time inflation really got going that you, quantum fluctuations in that epoch made a background of gravitational waves. The accelerations were so big. And that's the source of a, a cosmic background of gravitational waves which has been carefully calculated by a lot of people now. And there are different models of inflation, but they all agree on that it's going to be something like one part in 10 to the 13 of closure density is the energy density in that maybe 10 to the 10 minus 14. And we're so far away from that. At, uh, all those experiments are so far away from being able to do that that you have to do something like do co Big Bang Observer, which will get you to that distance, to, to that sensitivity. And that's a mission that I think is going to happen if, for example, these experiments with B modes, which I'll describe in a second, are c come to a, if they come to something that is a really good zero, it'll be hard to sell. If they come to something which is an ambiguous zero, it's not gonna be so hard to sell. Uh, uh, let me say what are the B-mode measurements. The B-mode measurements are, are a, a inference that's made about those primordial gravitational waves. And the way you get that is actually quite simple to understand. What it is, is if there is a background of primordial gravitational waves that came from very close to the beginning, they have expanded with the universe during the inflation they expand along as the geometry expands. Right. There's nothing to keep them from ex not expanding. And when you get to the point when the three degree background radiation gets formed, which is sort of at the end of about 300,000 years after the, the first, uh, after the explosion, 300,000 years after the explosion, suddenly the electrons and the protons get together again. They make hydrogen atoms. The energy, the thermal energy is down to 10 EV or so. You know, in the thermal energy, it's cool to that 10 EV, which is pretty hot, but it's, that, but it's gotten to that point, electrons will stick to protons. Then, all of a sudden, the universe becomes quite transparent. You no longer just have Thompson scattering. You have, you have, you have Thompson scattering of, of, of bound electrons, which gives you a threshold that you don't get much scattering at energies below uh, 10 to the 15 hertz, okay? frequencies of 10 to the 15 hertz. You know, it's just the Balmer series ends it. And so uh, what happens is that you see the polarization 
of the cosmic background as it is given to you by the plasma clouds that are there at that time in the universe. 300,000 years after the explosion, you have plasma clouds, which are emitting the 10, the ten Kelvin, okay? Uh, I mean, what am I talking about? The 10,000 degrees Kelvin. And now that's now three, de three degrees Kelvin. Right, right. They're emitting it. And they're emitting it depending on how hot the plasma is. Uh, plasma is hot in places where the gravitational wave has caused an expansion this way. In other places, the other places there's been a contraction. The gravitational waves make contraction, and they heat the plasma. So you get a distribution of polarizations of the electromagnetic waves due to the distortion of the plasma by the electromag by the gravitational, gravitational waves. waves. That's really cool. And that is very cool. The awesome. numbers are terrible. Okay, the numbers are you. The effect itself, the anisotropy, is 10 to the minus 5 degrees Kelvin. That's the anisotropy that makes the that's the structure that was left by the by the dark energy and by the by the by, by the by dark the matter. Now, the polarization can be measured in terms of a temperature also, the Stokes vector, the Stokes the matrix, and it's about you have to be able to measure about 10 to the minus 8 to 10 to the minus 9 Kelvin. And they m have now gotten detectors that are good enough to do that. So it turns out that detectors exist to make that kind of a measurement from the ground or from space. The thing that's screwing it up is that there are a lot of other things that make polarization in the universe, especially the goddamn dust in our own galaxy. And it is sitting there fucking the thing to the wall, really. So how, how do they do detections like that? But are they doing it with light or are they doing it with... No, they're doing it with the microwaves. The microwave okay, with, with through the, the CMB. With, okay. with the CMB itself. Okay. Oh yeah. Okay. And the CMB and they can and they map the polarization. Now, because of the fact that it is a cause a common source, it turns out the polarization patterns of the cosmic background are B modes. What does that mean? That means that they look like when you look at a map and you superpose all these three dimensional waves together, which is I can't imagine the mathematics, but a computer can. And you get a map of what is the polarization pattern look like. It looks like the B modes are, which are due to the gravity with gravitational wave. Mm -hmm. One of the things that causes them is the compression of an expansion of these clouds. They look like a pinwheel, a, a pinwheel. Okay. Uh, whereas the the temperature fluctuations themselves that are there just due to uh, temperature thermal temperature fluctuations, they look more like a divergence, either a divergence or in or out. So there are different patterns. And you can, from the polarization pattern, map the B modes and map the, so you can get the ratio of what's called the B mode pattern, which is the tensor field pattern to the scalar field pattern. Scalar field being the thermal ones, the tensor field being hopefully, mostly, the gravitational wave polarization piece. And it turns out that there was allegedly a discovery of this back three, d three years ago. And it caused a tremendous stir. And what happened is they people who had done this were not careful. They had, uh, it was, I think, a little bit of a deceit, but let it go. But the people had measured one channel. And when you do this and you want to get rid of the dust or you get rid of the synchrotron emission, there's a lot of things competing at different wavelengths as competing with this B mode that comes from the primordial background. Um, and you have to take care of them all. And they have different spectra. And the way you do this experiment, and the people are doing it this way now, is you have to have a channel at 50 gigahertz, another channel at 90 gigahertz, another channel at 120 gigahertz. And these are channels that they, they have primary components from different astrophysical things that are going on between that radiation that came from 300,000 years ago, of uh, 300,000 years after the explosion, right, right, right. to those things that are going on in our own galaxy, which are screwing up everything. Okay, so you have to be able to do that, and the boys weren't careful enough with this. And they made a discovery, they were found out, and so now what is the best value for that ratio that's now known, that R ratio? It's, I think, about point, see, it's under point 0.1, but not very much under 1. I think it's, it's call it point 0.8, point 0.08, point 0.08, right. And where are the predictions? God, they're anywhere. They could be point 0.001. That's the trouble. So that's the most exciting experiment I think that's going on right now 
These are things being done using the cosmic background at places like the South Pole, where the seeing is good, at the Atacama Desert in Chile, where the seeing is good. And I think, I hope, I just hope those guys see something. That would be absolutely spectacular. It would be the most interesting of all the discoveries. 